You'll turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Philippians chapter 3. This is the last message of the year. And uh, this week we'll celebrate New Year's. I don't know if you know this or not. Every, uh, every society celebrates this, but they don't all celebrate it at the same time. Different uh, countries, like in China, they, they will celebrate it somewhere between February and March when the new moon comes in. But every culture has its own little ways of celebrating. I heard that one culture uh, takes an object of failure and throws it out in the street. So if you were a wife and you're having an argument with your husband, you throw a plate at him. That plate's a reminder of a failure you had, and so you take that plate and you throw it out in the street. Getting rid of an old thing and hopefully preparing for new. In Scotland, I'm so glad we don't live in Scotland, the way they celebrate is called first footing. After midnight, you start to hear this. Because everybody wants to be the first visitor to your home. And they go around to family and friends to try to be the first footer in the, through the house. Um, in Spain, uh, you reach and celebrate with grapes. With each chime of the bell at midnight, you eat a grape. You say, that's silly. Y'all eat beans. <laughs> we all have these different things that we do for New Year's. Um, but you know what I've noticed is time marches on and it's marching fast really fast. And um, I'm amazed at these kids that have grown up and are marrying and moving away. Having kids of their own, it reminds me time has moved fast. Some of our children just bought a home. Reminder that time is moving what? Fast. And uh, we'll be leaving the service right after with the youth to celebrate this new year. And I think it's a great way to bring it in. And what we do is we look over the past year and then we look forward with new hope and vigor for the coming year. And uh, it's filled with a lot of maybes, will nots, and wills. Let me give you an example. Maybe this year won't be as stressful as last year. Maybe this year won't be as expensive as last year. Maybe this year will be better, a bit slower. Maybe the bad things that happened last year will be easier this year. Some will say, this year I will graduate. We had two graduate this year. Peyton Brooks and Andrew Suggs graduated this semester. <clears throat> Some of us are saying this, I won't get married this year. Paul does the same thing. If you will look with me in Philippians chapter 3, what he does is he looks back over his life and then he looks forward. And so as we purpose to begin this new year by making some new choices, I'm going to give you a few thoughts to help guide us this morning. We're going to read... Um, let's start at verse... Let's just read the whole thing. Let's start at verse 1. Paul's given some warnings to the church. He says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. He's talking about the religious people, the circumcision group. Beware of them. Verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Some of us need to hear that. You've been struggling and trying to change things and you're trying to do it all on your own. You're doing it in the flesh. Some of y'all work for God and you do it, guess what, all in the what? Flesh. Have no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4, though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning righteousness, 
which is in the law, listen, blameless. Let me put it in a way we can understand it. As far as doing and living the law in a right way, I did it perfectly. And he says, don't have any confidence in the flesh. I can brag, but even I don't do that. Look at verse 7. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ to be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward for those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything, think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, and let us be of the same mind. Let's pray. Father, your Son has declared to us that apart from him, we can do nothing. And as Michelle said, we are the light of the world. It's, it's the light that you call us to be. You say that we are the salt and light of the world. And that a city, like a city on a hill, we're to shine our light in such a way it'll be seen by all men. It's not what we do for you. It's what we allow you to do in us. So this year, help us to let you be Lord of our life. To be teachable, to surrender, to submit, to lead, to humble ourselves, to pray, to seek your face, to trust your word and let you be Lord. Not with our lips, but with our lives. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, amen. amen. I want to share three truths with you this morning. And the first truth is very simple. We, we see it, but I'm going to share it with you and break this passage down a little bit. The first truth is we enter the new year is recognizing who you really are. I want everybody to hear that. We all need to recognize who we really are. And what I mean by that is we are all a work in progress. We're all a broken bunch of misfits. Self-centered, selfish people claiming we're not. And the reason I share that is there's always places in our life to grow. There's always places in our life that we need to die to ourselves. I was uh, joking with Terry this morning about the Colts game, but Camden came into uh, to my office last night. We had a bunch of college kids at our house, and and, and I didn't ask permission, but that's because he loves me and he'll forgive me. <laughs> but he came in with his heart's desire. He said, look, you know, I know we're doing this, and this year I'm going as an adult. And so you think maybe I could watch the cult game? And, and I did this tongue-in-cheek. I kind of went. And before I even finished ribbing him, this is what he said. You know, you're right. You're right. I need to what? Die to, Die to myself. And he doesn't know this, but as he walked out of my office, I kind of smiled to myself. And I did give him hope. I said, we'll see what we can do. But as he walked, I kind of smiled to myself. But this is what I said. That's a young man that understands. He understands who he is. 
I have these desires, but I need to learn to die to myself. That's what being a Christian is. It's very important in any kind of growth in our life to be dissatisfied, especially with our Christian life. I want you to think about this. Paul has been a Christian for 30 years. He has been planting churches all over. He's been leading people to Christ. Been having miracles work through his body. He's been assaulting false teachers. He's been writing the very word of God. He has been caught up into heaven, and as, as many assume by a description he gives. And after 30 years, this is what he says. I've not already attained, and, I am already, uh, and I'm not already perfected. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I've noticed, and, and me and my wife were talking about this. We had somebody come to our house the other day, and I had somebody challenge me to think more. Just think through things more. Instead of just reacting and responding, think. And so we had somebody come to our house, and every time they come by, we kind of feel condemned. We're not good enough. And, and I was, well, that's just so, but this is what I thought to myself. Why, why is that? Why do I feel that way? It's not because they're godly. I'm not being convicted. I'm being condemned. And then there's other people that we have sat with while we've been on Christmas break that when I leave, I go, oh, God, could I be more like them? The difference is a, a sense of maturity. This is what I noticed Really mature Christians, really mature Christians are approachable, teachable. They used to have a great deal of humility. I've noticed they listen more than they talk. They recognize their own sinfulness. And they're not presumptuous about where they are with God. But people who think they are mature are usually very condemning, unteachable. They know it all. They listen very little. People avoid them. And they are blind to it, but they're very self-righteous and self-satisfied. Let me tell you what I mean by self-satisfied. People that are usually very good at things become very self-satisfied. So uh, when I go to the gym, there's people that run well. They're running at a good seven miles, eight miles an hour. I mean, a good little clip. And they do it for 15, 20, 30 minutes. And when they get off, they're not even really breathing real hard. And they walk different than everybody else. This is how they walk in the gym. Whew. Now, the rest of us are into mile two holding our ribs. And there's this arrogance about them, but I've noticed something. And there's, they're the same with bodybuilders or weightlifters. And you'll notice this in your, the ones that are, they have this air of, I'm self so I've arrived. <laughs> that is true until someone faster, bigger, or stronger comes in. And when that happens, this is what usually, what I've seen. You correct me if I'm wrong, because this is what you're going into. All of a sudden, they either become jealous, angry, talk trash about the other. They can't handle it because somebody is better than what? And they'll either not come around when they're around. I heard somebody, we were talking about football uh, with a couple, and their son didn't play football this year because there was somebody else in his travel team section that was better than him, so he just took the year off. Because he has to be what? He's self-satisfied. Someone that's not self-satisfied would look at that and go, oh, I've got somebody that will push me. I really haven't arrived. I need to learn to do it better like them. I could learn something from them. It happens in the church too, doesn't it? Someone preaches better than a preacher. You know what we'll do? Run them down. Or if I'm in the choir and someone new comes and sings, oh, I'll just let them know I don't like them. Instead of saying, like Paul, see, Paul's not like that at all. 
Paul says this, I'm the chief of sinners. He recognizes who he is. He doesn't have this air of, I know more than others. I worship more than others. I move more than others. I sing more. I, I listen to Christian radio more than others. I've arrived. Paul never did that. Paul said this, I am not, I'm not there. I haven't made it yet. The first truth as we enter this new year is to recognize who we really are. If you look at verse 10 in your Bible, this was, this was Paul's goal. You ready? That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering and being conformed to his death. The Amplified Bible reads it this way. And this, so that I may know him experientially, becoming more thoroughly acquainted with him and understanding the remarkable wonders of his person more completely. And in that same way, experience the power of his resurrection, which overflows in the active believers. That I may share in the fellowship of the sufferings, being continually conformed inwardly into the likeness, even into his death, dying as he did, so that I may attain the resurrection that, I will, that will raise me from the dead. You're... Your work, you're still under construction. He has begun a good work in you, he's going to continue it. And when you recognize that, you'll be like Ruth Graham. Ruth Graham was riding home and she saw a sign, it was a work sign, and she told her husband, That's what's going to be on my tombstone. And it is on her tombstone. Part of me jokingly thinks she saw it in West Virginia. It says this End of construction, thank you for your patience. And that's what's on her tombstone. She recognized who she was. She was continually under construction. She continually could grow. She could continually know him more deeply. We never arrive. Remember that as you go into the new year. That should bring you hope. You're not perfect. So when you mess up, guess what? It's who you are. But remember who he is and desire to know him more. Second truth. This is going to be a tough one because I'm not going to be able to preach it well. The second truth is pressing on with determination. Look at verse 12, second part of verse 12. But I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. That word press on is an athletic term. This whole chapter actually is filled with athletic terms. Look in verse 14. I press toward the goal for the prize of an upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Listen, Satan loves to get truth out of balance. He loves it. Because even get us out of balance, he can shipwreck us. So there's a lot of truths, they're parallel truths that you have to take together. I call them the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches of the Bible. You can't just have bread and peanut butter and call that peanut butter and jelly. You have to have both. So let me give you some that we have that we struggle with. Faith and works, peanut butter, jelly sandwich. They go hand in hand. You can't just have one without the other. James writes about that. Here's another one. Grace and repentance. They go together. If I, if I just take one, what happens is this. Oh, I can do whatever I want to. I can live with them and get drunk on the weekends and do whatever. God forgives me because he loves me. You're just living in Jellyville. It doesn't work. But if I go the other way and just, just focus all on the repentance and fighting sin and fighting sin without any grace, that's just peanut butter. God gives us both. We have some of that uh, in our convention right now. We have those that believe in the sovereignty of God and they believe in it so much that man has nothing to do with anything and they have to explain everything away. And then there's others that say, no, it's all about the free will of man and man has a choice. Listen, it's peanut butter and jelly. They go hand in hand. Satan wants us to focus on one over the other. So when Paul says, I press on, if we're not careful, what we will hear is, we have to do it. We have got to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps and we better get to work. You better get moving now. We've got to do it. T peanut butter. Because if you're doing that apart from the power of God, nothing. However, if I sit over here and go, 
I'll just wait on the Lord. No, don't bother me. I'm just going to wait. I see that with people looking for a spouse. I'm waiting on the Lord. Okay, you can sit in your living room, and that's okay. But chances of him coming and going, I'm here, is very slim. Now, can God do that? Yes, he can. But they go together. Let me give you an illustration to help us with this before I go any further. I like football. Football is a game that I believe teaches a lot about life. I really do believe that. <clears throat> the coach has a game plan. And the coach spends all summer evaluating the competition. He knows what the weaknesses are. He knows where the strengths are. He has been looking at everything. And his goal is to win the final game of the season. So he makes a plan, a game plan, to be executed by the team during football season. They only have a short amount of time to do it. And so the coach comes out with the playbooks. One of the first things they do, they're, they're going to strengthen and he's going to give them the tools they need to win the game. They're going to work with weights. They're going to be doing sprints. They're going to get their wind up. They're going to learn to stand on the line. They're going to learn all the basics. But the end game plan is to know the game. Now the coach says, I need you to execute this and I need you to do it the way we talked about in practice. And if it goes well and the coach has done their homework, they'll win. Are you with me so far? However, if while that football team is in the huddle and they do this, coach doesn't know what he's doing, fellas. We're going to win this on our own. We're going to call the plays. Can they win the game? Yes, they can. Will they win the season? No, they won't. We've seen it over and over. I've seen that happen. The other side is this. Um, you know, God wants us to win this game, and so we're going to pray, fellas, in every huddle. And when we get to line, we'll, we'll just wait to see God carry the ball across the goal line. Are they going to win that read? No. When we're doing our Christian life, and Paul understood this, those are the two extremes. If we think we're going to work hard and press forward to God and do a work for God and make it happen for God, you're in trouble. You're in a truth out of balance. But if you're also sitting back, kind of waiting, hoping, wishing, you're in trouble as well. A Christian is partnering with God letting him lead us and working hard. God draws out the truth. He gives us the game plan. It's found in his word. Listen, this is the greatest title of book I ever saw. God's will is his word. You want to do God's will? Do his word. Period. You don't have to guess. You don't have to look for it. God's will is his word. He provides the Holy Spirit to equip us to live this life. He pours out his grace in order for us to perform it. And what he calls us to do is to be obedient to that and then work that as hard as we can. Does that make sense? So when God comes, I do this. I want a good marriage. God, give me a good marriage. God, give me a good marriage. God, I don't know why you're not fixing her, God. Give her a good marriage. It's not going to work. If I come in it this way, oh, we're going to have a good marriage, baby, and this is what we're going to do. Every Friday, you're mine. Date night. Be there. Six o'clock. I ain't going to work either. What I got to do is say, what does God's word say? Be a student of your wife. Okay, what does that mean? And I study that. Love your wife as Christ loves the church. Well, how did Christ love the church? I got to study that. I looked at, oh, that's how he loved it. He did this, 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 this. And then I execute it. Now I'm partnering with God and I'll see the fruit of my obedience. That's faith and works. That's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Y'all may not like peanut butter and jelly. I love it. Peanut and butter sandwich is like this. A jelly sandwich, it's really sweet, but there's something great about peanut butter and jelly. Paul says we're to discipline ourselves unto godliness. Paul says in Hebrews 12, well, we don't know if it's Paul. We assume it was Paul or Luke. We don't know who the author is. Excuse me. Hebrews 12 says that our Christian walk is a race. 
to run it well as we are running it in front of witnesses. Timothy says, and to Timothy, Paul says, fight the good fight. He uses an illustration in Ephesians about wrestling with principalities powers. These are all athletic terms. It requires discipline, diligence, but the most in Paul, obedience in the context of a relationship. But the Bible also teaches this, apart from Christ, you can do nothing. And I can do all things. In the very next chapter, Paul says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What we should be doing is pr pressing on with determination to let God do a work in us and through us. The last one is this, and this is the most important one. The third truth is gaining a proper perspective. Look at verse 13. Brethren, I do not count myself as apprehended, but one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize for the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. There's two things there he talks about. Forgetting those things which are behind and the one thing I do. They're tied together. What I want to say is don't go backwards, go forward this new year. Many of us live in the past. We dwell in the past. We can't leave the past whether that's been a hurt or betrayal or a lie. Maybe you were violated as a person. You can't let go. I had somebody, I uh, went to Walmart last night and um, this girl came out and she's, her daughter's going on a trip with us and I gave him a hug and she said, you take care of my baby. I said, I will do the best that I can. But if I'd have said this sermon, I think it would have been a different response. Take care of my baby. Oh, don't worry. I've got it. I've learned how to drive with the rear view mirror. Excuse me? Yeah, I've gotten so good I can look in the rear view mirror the whole time I'm driving. With my peripheral vision, I can see everything, but I can focus on what's behind me. Whose car is my daughter riding with? <laughs> now, we'd laugh at that and go, you can't drive that way. Yes, you can. Try it on the way home. Well, maybe not. Some of you probably shouldn't. <laughs> and we laugh because that's so ridiculous, Pastor. But that's how some of us live our life. We can't move forward to look forward because we're constantly looking in the rearview mirror. I can't let go of that. They hurt me too bad. You're driving with the rearview mirror. I can't forgive them. You don't. Listen, some of y'all need to forgive and let go. You ever heard this term, forgive and forget? Is that biblical church? No. Unless you're using Greek. Let me explain what I mean. When most people say forgive and forget, this is what they mean. Terry Carson hurts me. He, I don't know, he stole my fish off my, I don't know. He did something to hurt me. And somebody comes and says, forgive and forget. Can I wipe that from my head? If someone raped me and I said, look, you just need to forgive and forget. Are they ever going to forget about that? That's the most unbiblical statement you will ever say out of your mouth. Because what you're saying is forgive and just wipe it out of your head. Well, God does that. No, he doesn't. Yes, he does. He puts our sin in the corners back and drops our sins into the sea. He forgets our sins. No. Then he's not all knowing, does he? Does he just wipe his mind clean? Do we say, forgive my sin? And then he goes, boop. When Paul says, forgetting what is behind, this is what this Greek word means. It's a powerful word. Don't let it affect you, hold you, grip you, impact you, influence you. Now let's say forgive and forget. Let's use it with that definition. Forgive and don't let it affect you, grip you, impact you, or influence you. So when God says, I've forgiven your sins, I've forgotten your sins, what is he saying? It no longer impacts me, grips me. The relationship's been restored. I'm not holding a grudge. It's forgotten. I told this young girl I was going to use this as an illustration, and I'm going to use it right now. We had somebody stay at our house over the summer. And they help around the house and they cleaned our dishes in our dishwasher with liquid soap. Now she didn't know that. She's trying to help. 
So her intention's good. And she filled that canister right on up to the top. <laughs> now God in his providence allowed that to happen as we're coming home. And Beth said, what's all over the floor? I said, that is soap suds. I mean, it was all over. I said, what? And I said, what's going on? I opened up and, I was, and it's filled. I've never seen anything like it. <laughs> you couldn't see the dishes. And I'm like, oh. And it took a second. I said, you know what? I bet you they use dishwasher soap. So I went upstairs and I said, hey, um, did you use dishwasher soap in the, yeah, is there a problem? So now I wasn't going to show her and make her feel bad, so I'm grabbing the towels while she followed us downstairs. And how did she feel? And then we went on YouTube to figure out how to get that out of your dishwasher. It takes a little while to do that. And this is what I said. She felt horrible. I said, look, don't worry about it. It's all good. We've learned a life lesson. You'll never do this mistake again. It's, it's a great learning opportunity. And I did. We loved up all on that's forgetting. I didn't hold anything against her. I knew what her intentions were. Could I got mad about that and really held a grudge and this is a hardwood floor. Yeah, I could have. God does the same thing with our sins if we're in Christ. He doesn't hold it against us. He doesn't hold a grudge, doesn't give us a silent treatment. Doesn't punish us on our performance. He forgot. And we need to have a proper perspective. Do you all remember Elizabeth Smart, the girl that was abducted from her home? She was kidnapped out of her home. She was in, the, in a room with her sister and a man came in who thought he was a prophet of God, knew he was a prophet of God. And he put a knife to her throat and said, you're coming with me. And she was kidnapped. And for the next nine months, she lived a nightmare. And she was so brainwashed and so controlled they would take her out in public even though she had the veil and, and she wouldn't try to get away or anything. Well, somebody noticed her, they caught her, and they saved her. Years and years and years later she gave a speech and this is what she said. She said her mom said something to her that changed her life because she felt totally devastated, her self-image totally devastated, her self-worth totally devastated by her own admission. And she said, I would never forget what he did to me. And when her mom got there, this is what she said. Elizabeth, what this man has done to you is, a ter is terrible and there are no words strong enough to describe how wicked and evil he is. He has stolen nine months of your life that you will never get back. And the best punishment you could ever give him is to be happy. Amen. It's to move forward with your life because feeling sorry for yourself and holding on to the past and dwelling on what has happened to you is only allowing them more control, more power, and still more of your life. So don't let that happen. Justice may or may not be served. Restitution may or may not be served. But don't you dare give them another second of your life. Don't let it affect you, grip you, impact you, and influence you is what she was saying. Some of us, the past is an anchor. And that's why you have so many problems in your life. That's why you don't trust people. That's why you won't forgive people. That's why you won't listen to anybody. Because you have thrown an anchor down in the past and you're driving with the rearview mirror. And God says, I want you to let that go. Forgetting the things that are behind and reaching forward. Some of us sadly have lived our whole life that way. Amen or oh me. Listen, it's done. And then he says, the one thing, I do one thing. How many of y'all like Tiger Woods? I know it was more like that before he cheated on his wife, wasn't it? <laughs> That boy can play some golf, amen or oh me. He has started when he was very young learning how to swing that golf club. Michael Jordan, what is he good at? How come y'all didn't say baseball? He played baseball. He what? That's right. He didn't play baseball very good. But he played basketball what? You know why? Because he focused in on that. Tiger Woods focused in on that. A gymnast that goes to Olympics, they've spent their whole life focusing in on 
that. But what would have happened to those people if they had done basketball, baseball, football? What would have happened? Would they have been good at one or good at all of them or half good? What, what happens when we try to be good at five things instead of one? We're a jack of all trade and a master of The one thing, I'm going to say it, some of us, including your pastor, need to shave some things out of their life and focus on a few things rather than a lot. I heard an amen over there. Billy Graham was asked, I didn't know this till this week, 22 times to build a college or a university in his name. He was promised the land and the money and the buildings, all they wanted him to do was come and help get that started. You know what he said that, you know what he said 22 times? No. But you can have an impact for generations? No. Don't you know the lives you can? No. Because God didn't call me that. He called me to preach the gospel and that will be a diversion. No. Do you think he regretted that, Glenn? I don't think he did. He focused on one thing and he did it well. So this is my, my commitment, not rev resolution. And sometimes we need to pray, wait, and evaluate and ask ourselves, is this my gift? Does this fit my calling? Does this fit how I'm made? Is this what God's truly asking of me? You know, when I stand before the Lord... Um, the first thing he's going to judge me on isn't how I led this church. He's not. He's going to ask me how I led my family. First ministry, y'all will do the same as well. If you have children, you're going to be asked, how did you disciple your children? What kind of example did you set before your children? How did they see Christ in you? See, we don't talk about that stuff on Judgment Day. We talk about these things. How many people did we lead to the Lord? I don't think that's going to be on the book right at the gate anyway. It's going to be things like this. Did you love your wife? How did you love your brothers and sisters in Christ? How did you pray for your religious leaders? I commanded that to you. Did you not do that? How did you treat the poor? Did I not command you to do that? You remember when that guy came over to your house in the middle of the night, it was 10 o'clock, and asked to borrow your hoe, and you said, come back tomorrow? Did you not read what I wrote in Matthew? Those are things we're going to get questioned on. Matter of fact, Jesus says we will be judged. And this is scary. This is why I'm so glad Jesus saved me. You could be, you're going to be judged by every word you ever said. Ermel, how am I going to do on that one? I am thankful Christ died for me. Money, work, how we spend our time. So this new year, what I want to challenge you to do is make more time for Jesus. Make more time for your family. Invest more time in your kids and your grandkids. David said there was one thing he desired. It's from Psalm 27, 4. I'm going to close with that. The one thing that I've desired of the Lord, that I will seek him. That I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. What was Paul's goal? To know Jesus more. Recognize I'm not where I should be. I haven't attained it. I'm not even close. I'm going to press on. I'm really going to determine to walk with him and obey him and work hard for him. But the one thing I'm going to do is forget the things in the past, not just the failures, the successes as well. And I want to know him more. There could be nothing better you could do this new year than to say, and listen, I'm not even telling you to read your Bible this year. You need to do it. I'm not saying you need to pray more. You need to do that too. But if your goal is not to know Christ more deeply, you're just wasting time. Amen or oh me. Let's as a church commit this year to know Christ more intimately. Amen. Let's pray. Father, this message was for Christians. 
that we would come to know you more deeply. Father, forgive us for thinking we have arrived and that we know it all. That Forgive us for times people are telling us things and we just know it. We don't need, we don't need to hear anything. Forgive us when we think we're better. Forgive us when, sadly, we think we are so right that everybody else is wrong. Give us a heart like Paul that we know who we are, that we don't know everything. And Father, if we're honest, there's times we're scared because we don't know. And instead of pretending just to be honest with our friends and our family, but most importantly with you. Father, I pray that you'd help us to press on with determination to discipline ourselves unto godliness with those things that we need to, like reading your word and our times of prayer times of fellowship and our church attendance, Father. But Father, I pray that our goal would be to know Christ, for that's what eternal life is, is to know you and the one he sent, Jesus Christ. Father, there's some here that don't know you at all. They're learning, you're drawing them, but they need to surrender their life. I pray that they would cry out to you and ask for forgiveness of their sins and for the gift of salvation. What a great way to start out this new year. Just help us, Father, to be the salt and light that you've called us to be, to be the light, to let your light shine in our life in such a way that they will see our good deeds and praise our Father above. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you'll turn with me in your hymnal to him, can we do amazing grace? What's 290? As with gladness, men of old. Let's do that. 290. We'll sing that as Lois leads us. And uh, if you're here today and you don't know Christ and you want to know, you come and talk to me. I'll even wait. I can't wait too long because those kids will get mad. But um, you do what the Lord leads you to do. And let's stand and sing. 290.